today on Beyond Six Seconds. I manifested a lot of these things too because I, I saw myself as an individual just doing great things and all of those things are coming through. But at the same time, I'm inspiring others that whatever you believe you could aspire to be, you can become that. Welcome to Beyond Six Seconds, the podcast that goes beyond the six second first impression to share the extraordinary stories and achievements of everyday people. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Garrison Red. Garrison is a TEDx speaker, para power lifter, model, dancer, and most of all, an advocate for disabled rights. He founded an organization called the Garrison Red Project with an essential goal of bettering the well being of disabled individuals through a variety of methods. Garrison provides resources and services like advice, motivation, inspiration, health, and more to improve the quality of living for disabled individuals. Oh, and the place where Garrison and I are talking today is a little bit noisy, so you may hear some background noise throughout our conversation. But in case you miss anything due to the noise, you can also find a full transcript of this interview on the beyond website. Garrison, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Carolyn. I really appreciate you taking, you taking the time out of your day to speak with me. Thank you. Well, thank you for spending the time with me. You have a really amazing story and you're involved in such a variety of different things. So why don't we just start off uh, learning more about the Garrison Red Project? So how did you get the inspiration to start that? I actually worked at the IRS for six years. Ah. And one day I was at my desk and I said, I'm way too cool for this. I'm a young man. I have good qualities and I wanted to leave something impactful on the world. So I woke up one day and I pretty much went to my manager and said, today will be my last day. I'm off to better things. And my inspiration really came from seeing like other kids with disabilities and they would come up to me like if I'm outside or wherever I was and they would say things like how, how I stay motivated and how much I inspire them to be something great. So through that, I just woke up one day and said, I'm going to start an organization. I'm going to start speaking around the world. I'm just going to do many of the great things that will inspire and motivate so many individuals like that was in circumstances like myself. Wow, that's incredible. And I guess I should mention, since no one can see us on the audio podcast, that you yourself are a disabled individual, or would you describe yourself that way? Well, I consider myself able with limitations Mm -hmm. because the reason why I say that is because I pretty much could do anything that anybody else could. For instance, if there's a staircase, I may not be able to walk up the stairs, but I am able to get up a flight of stairs, whether I have to scoot up on my backside or someone may have to carry me. Mm. At the end of the day, I could get to the next flight. So it's just a limitation to how I would be able to get there. True. So, you know, we talked a little bit about in your bio that the Garrison Red Project provides all kinds of resources and services. What kinds of projects or some of the things um, are you working on right now through the Garrison Red Project? Well, right now we're a host of adaptive events and those events could consist of rock climbing, um, adaptive basketball, um, hackathons things of that nature, just to spread awareness to individuals with disabilities and to give individuals with um, disabilities an opportunity to participate in different activities. Because there's a lack of resources in, I think, America and specifically in New York where individuals are able to get out and be in the world. And I think it was real important for me to try to showcase some of these individuals' abilities in an effort to increase inclusion Because a lot of people don't know that the disabled population is the largest minority demographic population in the world. Mm. Um, 20% of individuals identify themselves as being disabled. But on the other hand, 70% of individuals with disabilities are currently unemployed. So I try to create inclusive events as well. So I may have, like, like for instance, I will have an adaptive basketball tournament but I will actually have able-bodied individuals playing basketball right along with disabled individuals. Oh, wow. Very cool. So you really provide a whole range of help with employment and sports and involvement in that way. And we mentioned that you're also a TEDx speaker. And in your TEDx talk, you shared a little bit about your own challenges at first with finding employment. Do you find that the disabled individuals that you work with have challenges around finding employment and are you able to help them with that? 
Yeah, typically a lot of individuals come to me and inquire, you know, ways they can find employment. And a lot of times these individuals have their degrees, have the appropriate qualifications. However, employers are reluctant to hiring them. So that's when I decided to create inclusive events where individuals can learn from one another. So, for instance, an able-bodied manager of, you know, or CEO or executive could come out to one of my inclusive events and participate with individuals with disabilities, but they get an opportunity to ask questions and to know, learn about some of their abilities in order to increase awareness and help these individuals find employment. Because a lot of times in the, people feel that it's unethical to ask a disabled individual what they can and cannot do. Mm. So there'll be a misconception where they assume that this individual is unable to do certain things when actuality they are completely able to do so so like in my case what i was noticing is that employers would think they would have to accommodate me with different types of reasonable accommodations when that's totally not the case as long as i could wheel under my desk i was completely fine and i was completely able to carry out all the job duties as if i was an able-bodied individual right as you said you have these abilities you know there are just different things in the environment that you know need to be shift it around and then you can pretty much do anything yeah. that anyone else can do exactly and I, like i always tell people the wheelchair isn't a restriction society places restrictions on wheelchair users mm -hmm. so if, for instance if we made everything accessible then there would be no restrictions and there will would be no limitations at all because we would be able to do anything anyone else could do and that's the same for other disabilities as well so if we work on like universal design where everybody can access all facilities and all you know places of employment, all social arenas, then there would be no pretty much no difference in a disabled individual and an able bodied individual. Yeah, no, definitely. That's a really good point. I'd love to hear a little bit about some of the people that you've been able to impact or reach through the Garrison Red project. You know, you must either speak with people or, or help them get resources, whether it's employment or participating in sports or, you know, improving health. Do you have any success stories of someone that you worked with that are memorable to you that you would maybe want to share? Oh, yeah, definitely. All right. So I met this gentleman. Well, he's a gentleman now, but at the time when I met him, he was um, around 17 years old, getting ready to graduate high school. Mm -hmm. And he had spinal bifida, mm -hmm. which that's a injury that typically individuals are born with. So it's acquired at birth. So they lack the ability to ambulate. And this young gentleman, Patrick, he reached out to me to, you know, participate in some of my organization activities. And he would come every weekend and whatever, you know, I was hosting, whether it was a basketball event, a baseball event or a climbing event, he always made it on time and, and showed up with enthusiasm. So one day I asked him, like, what are you going to do after high school? And he said, I really don't know because I would love to go to college, but I don't know if I'll be accepted in, if I, you know, attend any university. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what type of school, you know, I started to inquire more, like what type of school you go to, you know, currently. And he said he goes to a school where it's mostly disabled individuals that attend that school. Mm -hmm. So I told him, you know, like in my case, when I went off to college, I was 19 years old and. I said, people's going to accept you for who you are. So once I told him that, like, he instantly felt motivated. And I told him, you know, you can stay in a dorm just like everyone else. And it will help with your independence overall. Because at the end of the day, I want you to be out in the world. You're a young man and you got to get out in the world. You got to see the world and you got to enjoy your life. You, you can't stay home for the rest of your life being that now that you graduated high school. So right now he's in Arizona, University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. It's his third year. He's a junior and he just completed an internship not too long ago. And he was telling me how it was a wonderful experience. And if it wasn't for my events and just speaking with me on a continuous basis, he don't know where he would have been at this point in life. Of course, I was joyful of that. But yeah. at the end of the day, he put in the work and it was him that actually went on to do what he aspired to want to become. And 
stuff like that is like fulfilling for me due to the fact that I didn't know I could have so much of an impact on individuals that start out as complete strangers <laughs> and yeah. then they become like family. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I like most about my not-for-profit organization is that I get to connect with individuals who sometimes, I won't say feel hopeless, but they feel as if they cannot do certain things that everyone else could do or everyone else their age can do. And it's me who tells them, like, you can live your best life. Whatever you want to become, you're going to become it. You just got to have the determination and the will, and you can't take no as an answer. And that's the most impactful stuff that I've ever done in my life. So wow. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. And it sounds like certainly for this young man, he saw you as a role model. It sounded like maybe he wasn't sure if he could go to college or would be accepted there because, I don't know, maybe he just didn't see an example of someone who had gone to college and, you know, had a disability and still is flourishing. So it sounds like you were able to provide that example for him. And, um, you know, even, even just knowing one person who is in your situation who can achieve big goals, I think that um, can help inspire people. And it sounds like that's what you did for him. Yeah. And see, another thing, when I started my organization, a big issue was that there's not too many individuals with a disability that people could aspire to become like a Wayne Gretzky or Michael Jordan or right. Mariah Carey or, you know, one of these influential individuals out here that people could look up to. And I said, I could be that person. Yeah. So that was one of my main reasons for starting the Garrison Red Project. I just wanted to be a person that other individuals with disabilities can look up to and say, if he did it, I could do it. Yeah, that's awesome. And you're right. We don't really see a lot of examples in like the media or popular culture of people using wheelchairs who are doing a whole variety of different things. So it's hard to kind of see what that example is. And it sounds like you're involved in a lot of different things. I mentioned in your bio that you're a, you've been a model, you're a dancer. So, you know, you're in the media in that, in that sense, doing in yeah. those things. Yeah. And you're also an athlete as well, a competitive athlete. Yep. You were always involved in sports since you were young. And now what you're competing in is um, powerlifting. Is, is that yep. correct? Your latest thing? Yeah. How did you decide to get into that? It's funny how I got into it, actually. Um, one day I was in the gym and a gentleman came up to me and he's like, you should play on my wheelchair football team. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, wheelchair football? football. I'm like, I never even heard of that. That sounds like dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> break a leg what happens like it just doesn't sound like something I should be doing right but he was like no you should come out meet some of the other athletes and some of the other people that's involved with it and going to wheelchair football um that wheelchair football practice actually changed my life and my whole outlook on adaptive sports prior to my injury I played football and my whole life was like pretty much dedicated to going to the NFL, buying my mother a big house. That's all I thought about. Mm -hmm. And when I got injured, my dreams was cut short. So I pretty much said to myself, I'm not going to get involved in any adaptive sports because I don't want to put 110% into something for it to not go anywhere. Yeah. So years passed. I'm in the gym. <laughs> Guy comes up to me, say, come out to my wheelchair football practice. I come out. And I meet this gentleman by the name of John Hammer, who's the president of the Wheelchair Sports Federation. And he's like, yo, you're in great shape. You should be involved in some type of athletics. And I said, like, I was like, I don't want to do team sports. Everybody does wheelchair basketball. I, I, I just wasn't into that. Yeah. So he said, there's other sports. There's thousands of other sports. <laughs> so I'm like, name some of them. And he says, you ever thought about wheelchair track racing or wheelchair field sports? And I said, you know, I never trained in track when I was in high school or anything. And I was an able body. So when he told me that, I automatically was intrigued. I'm like, they have that? Mm -hmm. So he said, yeah. And, tell you, and he did me a favor. He said, I'm going to hook you up and put you on the best track team junior track team in the nation, which was the New Jersey Navigator. Mm -hmm. So from there, I started doing field sports and wheelchair track racing, and I was loving it. And then one day, my coach, Jimmy Cuevas, says, I'm going to put you in a para powerlifting meet. Huh? He says, it don't look like you weigh that much, and you're pretty strong. So he puts me in this meet. Since there's not a lot of facilities I could go to to weigh myself, because like doctors and hospitals typically do not have a scale for wheelchair users, mm -hmm. they did. 
So I'm like, he's like, how much you think you weigh? I'm like 140 pounds. Uh-huh. I get on the scale and I weighed 120 pounds. Oh. And I was able to lift 250 pounds with no training wow. at all. Wow. Which was at that time, and it still is, one of the strongest um, lifts in the country. Wow. This was approximately two years ago. And then from there, the Team USA performance manager reached out to me the next day, instantly. Wow. And informed me to actually buy for a spot in Team USA Power Powerlifting. And then from there, I went to a level one camp. That's where they give you like educational stuff in regards to para power lifting before you can even compete. Mm-hmm. And then after that, they invited me to the Olympic Training Center, which is in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And at the Olympic Training Facility, I was able to lift about 270 pounds, weighing a little bit more, weighing about 130 pounds. Which from there, they knew I was like the real deal mm-hmm. and invited me to a para powerlifting national qualifier. Wow. And that's when I originally qualified to go to world championships in Kazakhstan, which was a year and a half ago. Wow. So it's like overnight I got into para powerlifting. That's amazing. You basically could lift double your weight, you're saying, without any training just because you were in such good shape from just being athletic and going to the gym. That's amazing. Yeah. So fast forward, I just competed in a national qualifier in Missouri, Mm -hmm. which I'll be attending world championships in Bogota, Colombia on March 16th to March 22nd. And I'm really looking forward to that. Actually, I finished 2019 competing against able bodies and I was second in the world competing against able bodies at 123 pounds. I lifted 290 pounds at a powerlifting meet, which place me second in the world. Wow. And how often do you train? Typically, I train three times out of the week with my strength coach, John Gaglione. I'm the first para power lifter he's ever coached. Uh-huh. Um, however, he has over like 15 years of experience in power lifting and power lifting coaching. He has his own gym and he coached a lot of nationally and world ranked power lifters. So uh-huh. he's an excellent coach. Him training me, we're off to a new venture in which I'm doing pretty well. So he's actually moving up the rank as a para powerlifting trainer. And he's going to become the head trainer of Team USA para powerlifting team. Wow, that's cool. And then the world championships that you're going to, is that a qualifier for the Paralympics? Yeah, it is a qualifier for the Paralympics. With this qualifier, I have to rank seventh in the world in order to compete at the Paralympics in Tokyo later this year. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. You're well on your way. That's so exciting. Wow. Very, very yeah, cool. It's, it's, I manifested a lot of these things too because I, I saw myself as an individual just doing great things and all of those things are coming true. But at the same time, I'm inspiring others that whatever you believe you could aspire to be, you can become that. Definitely. And you're proving that right in so many different realms from athleticism and the nonprofit that you run and, you know, even public speaking. So I think I first learned about your story from watching your TEDx talk, um, a recording of it that you did in 2018. How did you get that opportunity to do a TEDx talk? Well, I got the TEDx talk. Actually, a friend of mine's name, um, Connie Chi, one day informed me that I should do a TEDx talk. And when she informed me that I should do a TEDx talk, I said, I don't even know. At the time, I didn't even know what it was. Yeah which is funny. So Mm -hmm. I did the TEDx talk and from doing the TEDx talk, well, she informed me what it was. So I went and did some research and I was like, this is something I could do. So fast forward, I found out ways to go about it. I contacted an organizer. They was holding a TEDx talk in Long Island. And from there I said, Let me apply. (laughs) And I got applied and I was selected. Mm. And that was the first talk I did on that scale. I never spoke in public ever prior to that TEDx talk. Wow. Wait, ever? That's amazing to go from like never to something as big. Like that's a pretty significant stage. And, you know, I've never done anything remotely like a TED talk or a TEDx talk, but I hear there's a lot, you know, potentially it's a lot of pressure to get your message out in in a relatively short amount of time. Did you have to coach or practice a lot before you got on? Not really. And I'm saying this, the reason why not really, because I already had my story in my head that I've been replaying for years and 
years. And I just, that was my opportunity to get it out to the world. And so I did, you know, I did practice in a mirror, like every night for like the 30 days prior to the TED talk. Mm -hmm. However, um, I was prepared. I just felt confident that I'll be able to do it. What a lot of people don't know is that I'm a very sociable person. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't mind speaking to anyone. So it's like talking on a stage to me was just the same thing. It wasn't much different. So I, I think I built my confidence over the years of just being able to express myself and it was just another day, another thing. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, you can tell from watching it that you have a real connection with the audience. And, you know, like you said, it's a conversation. I think that's probably the best way to approach something like that when telling our stories. Yeah. One thing I don't have or I try to control, which is very important, I try to control my fear with anything that I'm doing. And I think that's one thing that like sets me apart from a lot of other individuals that I'm able to control my fear and I'm able to take a chance. So it works out for me. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I think a lot of us are fearful when we're doing something new or that we aren't sure if we're going to succeed. But, you know, as you said, it's it's managing that fear and acting and doing things despite maybe being afraid. That's the action. That's how we achieve our goals and get new experiences. Exactly. Exactly. So, yep. So if you could control your fear, I mean, that's what um, holds a lot of people back in life. It's just fear. So you just got to manage it. Yeah. Do you have any tips for how to, to manage it? Do you have any like meditations or things you'd say to yourself or deep breathing, breathing. or anything? Yeah, yeah, yep. deep breathing. I like doing a lot of breathing exercises and that, that goes for everything I do with powerlifting, with speaking, with modeling. It's all the same thing in my mind. So I try to do a lot of like breathing exercises. I take five minutes out the day each day just to breathe. And I think that really helps me. And before an event, I'll take five minutes and breathe right before the event. And I do a lot of deep breathing, trying to expand my stomach into my fingertips and things of that nature, holding my breath. Also, like breathing through my nose and things of that nature, mm -hmm. just different ways to relax myself. Yeah, it's really powerful. Most of us throughout the day don't breathe properly. So um, if you do take that time to really concentrate on your breath and take those deep breaths, it works wonders with a lot of things like fear and just general health. You know, it's great. Yeah, you'll be surprised. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so Garrison, you're already achieving so many things and you're still a young man yourself. What big goals do you still want to accomplish in your life? Well, I want to win a Nobel Peace Prize. That's one of the main goals. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to be mayor of New York City one day. I also mentioned that in my TED Talk as well. Mm -hmm. I feel that I will be able to impact the world on a larger scale if I win a Nobel Peace Prize and if I'm mayor of New York City. And I can implement so many changes that could just benefit everyone because right now there's so much chaos going in the world where people just need to realize that we're all the same and we're all equal to one another. So I think I could really, you know, have a strong impact on the whole entire world in a few years once my messages get across on a worldwide tip. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So you're really expanding into every sphere, you know, going into uh, wanting to go into politics as well. And you're right. That is a completely different way to really make policies and implement a lot of change on a, a large scale. Oh, that's great. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Very cool. So, you know, how do you usually get in contact with people through the Garrison Red Project? Do they usually come to you? Do you do outreach or how does that usually happen? I do a combination of both. So like I will host events where I'll collaborate with other organizations. They don't have to be necessarily a disabled organization that's catered to disabled individuals. It could be any type of organization. The reason being is because pretty much everybody knows someone with some form of disability, whether it is visible or not able to be seen. It's still a disability. So I try to connect with as many organizations and partner and do tons of collaborations. Mm -hmm. I have on my website, people can subscribe, which is pretty cool because I can, you know, send them out updates and mail and things of that nature on upcoming events that they can attend. So that's really helpful. And also um, Instagram, social media works well also. 
through Instagram, people can contact me and I always have my contact information on my page. So it's very easy to access me or reach out to me through private message or direct messaging, you know, depending on the social media. So those are some of the avenues they can go about reaching out to me. But yeah, it's tons of ways. Very cool. So yeah, I can put a link to your website, to your Instagram yeah. and any other social media. I'll put them in the show notes so that people can you know, reach out to you and learn more about your work that way. Yeah, and I'll definitely will send it to you. Perfect. Garrison, this has been a really interesting conversation. I really enjoyed learning about all of the different things that you're involved in and just all the different ways that you're inspiring people. And uh, I'm sure we'll continue to inspire people as you uh, expand your own sphere of influence and enter politics and pursue uh, winning the Nobel Peace Prize and pursue your athletic competitions and, and all of that. As we close out, is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to know or anything that they can help or support you with? Well, if there's anybody out there that's looking to you know, sponsor me, a lot of the activities that I do are I have to fund myself or fund through grants. So if there's any individuals that would like to sponsor or partner with me, feel free to reach out to me. Also, as far as power powerlifting, I do have to fund that a lot on my own. Typically, Team USA only gives us a small amount of dollars to help each athlete. So, you know, I'm always looking for endorsements or sponsorships as well, as far as power powerlifting. So if anybody wants to get in touch with me after hearing this interview, please do so. And we can discuss more. Absolutely. Yeah. Please get in touch with Garrison. He's doing really amazing work. And, you know, any way that we can help him continue to do that great work is uh, much appreciated. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you, Garrison. Thanks so much for being a guest on my show today. Thanks, Carolyn. I really appreciate um, coming on your show. I really appreciate you taking the time to hear my story. Thanks for listening to Beyond Six Seconds. Please help us spread the word about this podcast. Share it with a friend. Give us a shout out on your social media or write a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. You can find all of our episodes on our website and sign up for our free newsletter at www.beyond6seconds.com. Until next time.